Here we go. <laughs> Good morning to everybody. Good morning. Thank you to everybody who was willing to pitch it this week for the um, Methodist if they need, when they needed help getting set up for a funeral this week. So I don't know that they actually used our space or not, but they got set up and all that okay, so we were good for them. So nobody called ever. Yep. So they guess. they were okay. That they just wanted to back up in case they ran into a problem with a light shorting out or something. So. That was all we needed to do, so we were good. Um, Bible study does meet on Tuesday. Um, we are in chapter 13 of Costal Discipleship. And if you were interested, I did post the information for the book club for next month. You can pick that up at the library. Um, or you can, of course, go to Downtown Books and order the book. Or you can get it on your... Um, Kindle if you were interested. And it is available on Audible if you prefer to listen to your books. So you have multiple ways of reading the book. Uh, Jan, are you doing, Jan Rogers, you're doing the presentation next time, is that correct? One of the Jans is doing it. And the other's doing, no, no. no you're doing refreshments and, you're doing presentation and you're doing refreshments, okay. <laughs> One of the Jans is doing refreshments and one of them is doing presentations. I just don't remember which. So, there you go. <laughs> What's the name of the book again? Goodbye to a River. It's actually in the oh, announcements. So, yep. Oh, yeah, I got it. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's at 10 o'clock on October 8th. Um, we did a lot of cleaning here yesterday, so we will just need to get stuff out to the dump probably Saturday. Um, of this week, I just need a pickup truck to get it all out to the dump. Do you want to set a time? Um, I can write down. Let's mm -hmm. say between 10 and 11. Okay. Um, well, Jim and I will make sure we get the one thing that's too heavy for me to get up the stairs by myself up on Thursday, and then we'll get all of the stuff into the dump, out to the dump then. Um, so if anybody wants to help me drag stuff upstairs. Yeah, they usually charge a fee. I know, I'll have money for it, so. There's no electronics in that stuff, so. Will you tell people about the stairs stuff out there? Yes, there are um, some items that we had at one point been selling some fairly traded items here at the church. When the missions team were going through their cupboard, we discovered we had a few leftovers. So there are a few remaining items from Serve, which is the organization that did those fairly traded items. Um, out here on the one table. So if you would like to make a donation, whatever you think is a fair price, some of them still have their price tags on the back, um, make a donation for those items and they are yours. There's a basket there, we'll make sure that it ends up in the mission folder for those. So please go ahead and make those donations and um, take them to and take those items so that we don't have to put them back in the cupboard so there's a nativity set there there is a couple of other carved pieces so if you have a grandkid or somebody who might need some kind of christmas present there's some penny whistles there's some other items there so take a look at those um take them home um, make a donation for them we would be happy for them to go to a good place so 
take a look at those. There are also some cards, um, some thinking of you and get well cards. Most of the people there are not sick at the moment. They're either in a nursing home or have been shut in because of um, the virus and things like that and have not been able to get out much. So we just thought we would send them thinking of you cards. Um, so just sign those. There's a couple of anniversary or birthday cards still there too. So take a moment and sign those for this month as well. Um, there is one more card that we need to put out. I realized I've, I wanted four out and I only mentioned three, so I, there'll be one more next week, so. Um, are there any other announcements? Jennifer? Jennifer says, thank you if you didn't hear. So she has been able to get rides to and from work. So she does appreciate that greatly. Um, we do appreciate that as well. So take a moment, please stand up, turn and face your neighbors and say the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace. Good morning, everybody. Peace. Mm -hmm. As one reminder, you are welcome to stop at the pastor's new home and see the new home or stop for coffee or tea, though I will admit that you're, if you want coffee, I'm going to have to feed you decaf. <laughs> so you are welcome to stop. I'm not home much right now. We're running around like crazy people trying to get the, the school started at the moment. Um, I'm teach, I am um, one of the gateway tutors and... We are setting up for some testing and stuff like that, so I've got to get tested to test. You wouldn't think that they make you take a test to be able to test, but they want to make sure that you don't do anything you're not supposed to when you're proctoring exams. So this week I'm doing a bunch of that. Um, remind me to talk to you after church about that. We're setting up a time for Friday. <laughs> Ages are stuck together. There we go. Let us join together in the call to worship. O oh God, open my lips. And my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Praise to the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. When the people of Egypt, of Israel left Egypt, when Jacob's descendant left that foreign land, The Red Sea looked and ran away, and the Jordan River stopped flowing. The mountains drifted like ropes, the hills jumped around like a ram. What happened, sea, to make you run away, and you, O oh Jordan, that why did you stop flowing? You mountains, why did you like ropes, the hills, why did you jump around like a ram? Tremble, earth, at, the, at God's coming, at the presence of the God of Israel. So who has seen fun goat pictures on TV? Um, nobody's ever seen the little goats running around. People are dressing up goats kind of like they do their dogs these days. 
well, I couldn't get good pictures that didn't, I couldn't find ones that didn't have copyright on them. Um, but there were really cute pictures of goats running around in, in Halloween costumes and Christmas costumes. And um, there's a goat that really didn't like his costume so much he was eating the hat. Apparently the thing to buy right now is Nigerian goats. The Nigerian dwarf goats, they're not very big. The adults are about this tall. They're really cute. Um, by the way, if anybody's wondering, they make really good, um, they, part of the reason they work really well is that they're really drought resistant. And so that they're using them a lot for things like Heifer International and World Vision and things like that in places where they don't have a lot of water because they don't need a lot of water. They're only this tall, but for only being this tall, they produce a lot of milk. So they're um, really good. And of course, goat's milk is rather hypoallergenic. They don't need a lot of food. They're really useful. So that psalm that we just read is one of the psalms that the people of Israel use when they reflect on the Passover. And if you look at the psalm, it talks about what we're going to read today in the um, Old Testament lesson. Um, when we read that lesson, it talks about the waters of the Red Sea rolling back. And we'll talk a little bit about why it's not the Red Sea and why it's the Reed Sea, but we'll get to that in the sermon. Um, but it talks about that. So why does the Jordan and why does the Reed Sea flow backwards? And um, it says, why do, they, why do mountains skip like goats? That's next week. So you'll get to that one next week. But um, and if you look at these goats, they're really happy. They jump and they bounce and they run around and they're kind of funny to look at. But if you haven't seen them, take a moment if you have internet and can take a look on your phone or on your um, computer and look at these goats. They're kind of happy. And a lot of people have taken this verse as a kind of negative verse in scripture, that this is a scary thing because it's an earthquake it's talking about. But when you look at this verse from the point of view of the people in Exodus, it's a happy thing. They're meeting God for the first time in years, after years of slavery. They're going to the mountain. They're passing through the Red Sea. They're leaving captivity. They're getting to see something they haven't gotten to see for a long time. They're getting to worship God. So. I've got a whole bunch of people who have never seen these happy goats running around in Christmas costumes and Halloween costumes. But if, to take my word for it, the image here is a happy one. They're bouncing and they're happy and they're laughing and they're celebrating. So bounce like a goat. I meant to bring in a cartoon. Again, you probably couldn't have seen it because it was only about this big. But there's a picture of Moses and God sitting, trying to fish in a river. And God is sitting on one side and Moses is sitting on the other side. And God turns to Moses and says, Moses, stop it. You look down at the river. And Moses has got his bobbin in the water and the fish are all around his bobbin. And then God's part of the water is parted. And he can't get his fish and hook in the water because Moses keeps parting the water. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Laugh and have fun because you're getting to meet God. That's the story of Exodus. Laugh and have fun because you're getting to meet God. Skip like goats and let the waters roll back. Let us pray. Dear God, Help us to be happy and to skip like goats, even when our knees don't let us, and it feels like the world is coming to an end. Help us to remember that you are always there. Amen. Let's take a few moments to ponder our lives and the wider community. Where do we need forgiveness? Where do we need to forgive? Where do we need 
to intersect with the wider community? Where are the attitudes and the practices needing to be changed? Where do we need to seek forgiveness? Where can we affect change? Where have we been wounded? What needs transformed? How can we begin to forgive? Let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose hate is hidden from our sins, and whose mercy we forget in our blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults confiding in your grace, and finding in our, our refuge and strength, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Holy One, you call us into your, this ever-expanding grace, turning 70 times 7 is not too much when we follow your lead into a future of grace and peace. Glory be to the one who, working in us, can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Our sins are forgiven, 70 times 7. Amen. First reading is Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who had been in front of the army of Israel, moved and went to the rear. The pillar of cloud also moved until it was between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The cloud made it dark for the Egyptians, but it gave light to the people of Israel. And so the armies could not come near each other all night. <clears throat> Moses held out his hand over the sea. And the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind. It blew all night and turned the sea into dry land. The water was divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with walls of water on both sides. The Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the sea with all their horses, chariots, and drivers. Just before dawn, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He made the wheels of the chariots get stuck so that they moved with great difficulty. The Egyptians said, The Lord is fighting for the Israelites against us. Let's get out of here. The Lord said to Moses, Hold out your hand over the sea, and the water will come back over the Egyptians and the chariots and drivers. So Moses held out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the water returned to its normal level. The Egyptians tried to escape from the water, but the Lord threw them into the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots. The drivers and all the Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them was left. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground with walls of water on both sides. On that day, the Lord saved the people of Israel from the Egyptians and the Israelites saw them lying dead on the seashore. When the Israelites saw the great power with which the Lord had defeated the Egyptians, 
They stood in awe of the Lord, and they had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. Jim Wallace tells this story of his visit to South Africa in 1987. Nelson Mandela was still in prison, and the world thought it was for good. School children were being killed daily by government police, and the struggle seemed to be at a standstill. While he was there, he met a 14-year-old boy who, like many there, was organizing in elementary and high school. I asked him if he was optimistic for the future, and he said yes. If he, and I asked him if he still thought there would be a new free South Africa someday. And he stated to me matter of factly, I shall see to it personally. There is simply no other alternative than for each person to see to it personally. We can sometimes spend lifetimes trying to figure out miracles or trying to explain them to our scientific minded friends. But to do so is to miss the point of miracles. Miracles are the breaking in of another world, another set of rules to our ordinary everyday life. They don't make sense. They can't. And if we spend all of our lives questioning them, we spend a lifetime asking the wrong questions. This miracle, this sign in the swamp, which is now the Suez Canal, does not hinge on 40-foot or 400-foot walls of water rising on either side of a band of ragtag ex-slaves. Jim Wallace does not tell us whether that young boy lived to see the miracle that was almost the almost nonviolent revolution in Africa. The English and Indian settlers who advocated for the inclusion of all people of South Africa in the early 20th century certainly did not live to see it. The Zulu who rose in armed rebellion did not live to see their brothers and sisters walk free and proud once more. And we do not know if Jochebed, Moses' birth mother, lived to see her people walk free. The strong probability is that she did not. Yet we know that each of these people saw their longed for freedom personally. Perhaps the best definition of faith we can have to see personally what we cannot possibly see with human sight. Or as Madeline Lingle has said, some things have to be believed to be seen. We can spend all of our lives looking for rational explanations, or we can believe some things to be true and suddenly find them with our own eyes, ears, nose, or hands. There is nothing wrong with questions and quests for truth. 
But there are some things that questions and quests are not good for. All the people of Israel had were questions, whining and complaining. Some things we simply must hold on to, even where our eyes may be telling us something different. This is the first step on God's road into the sea. The second step begins when we recognize that the ch what chains us away from the land of life and freedom. For the people of Israel fleeing Egypt, that began with their release from actual physical slavery. Their masters, despite their earlier promise to let them go, now take up pursuit. They harness, harass the people to the very edge of Egyptian territory, and then they just reach that narrow strip of land, a brackish salt swamp between the Mediterranean and Red Seas, the Yam Suf, or the Sea of Reeds. They overtake them, and they mean to run them down. The Egyptians are better equipped with chariots and infantry. The Israelites know what happens to runaway slaves. Going backwards isn't an option. Going forwards seems impossible. They ne will never make it through the changing paths of that salt swamp. Even if the crocodiles, bull sharks, and hippos don't kill them, it will be a simple matter for the Egyptians, either the ones pursuing them, or the ones in the various garrisons of the Sinai to run them to ground. They believed that they were going to die. And when the winds begin to blow, revealing a wide muddy path where they can stick together and make it through the swamp, they finally begin to have hope. Mostly on foot and with few wheeled vehicles, they can make it through that swampy ground. But the chariots will become stuck buying them time. God provides a way out of the land of bondage and into freedom. We begin to hear another voice telling that story as we begin to hear it in chapter 14. It is possible, says Walter Brueggemann, that Pharaoh himself can be understood as another voice, as Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian oppressor, during the exile of the Jewish people six centuries later after the Exodus. And it is not just Nebuchadnezzar. It is significant that it is like Pharaoh and most of the other foreign kings in the Bible. However evil they may be, they do not get a name. Thus he may be identified with and experienced as every one of the powers that may be, how every overwhelming, every well-armed oppressor for all time. He is a cipher for evil. He is every evil king. If God and empire face off, the story reminds us, in any situation or any time, God is always going to win. We, too, face empires and powers that would kill us if they can. For most of us, they are not found in nation states, but in personal relationships and on our own destructive thought patterns. This belief in strength and power is not just a thing for the rich and the political, but for all of us who fall into self-destructive myth that we are sufficient to the daily task. We say that we can handle it on our own, but then illness, death, addiction, an abusive relationship, or any of a countless number of other issues brings us to the edge of the swamp. Our enemies close in and behind, and the way in front seems lost. We run blindly into the maze of paths, getting lost until we finally call out to God and the winds begin to blow. A light appears before us and we can see God moving before us to create a clear, straight path. It may still require us to get a bit muddy, but our enemy cannot follow. If they do, they too will become bogged down in the mud. 
these unnamed kings who pursue and chase us into the sea, are faced in our responses to politics and diseases in our own time. They hound us and bite at us in social media and on the news. They challenge us with untruths presented as fact. They cause us to stumble over our own ability to discern truth from falsehood. They divide us one from another. In the Fellowship of the Ring, the book, not the movie, Frodo and his friends come to the inn of the Prancing Pony. After barely escaping nearly fatal trouble, not once, but twice, Gandalf is not there, and Strider must persuade them to let him help them. In the end, they are presented with a letter from Gandalf, and it contains proofs of Strider's identity, and they do allow him to help him. Eventually, they come to trust him as he proves himself trustworthy, as they cross through their own sea of reeds and he brings them safely to Rivendell, defending them at great personal cost. Yet they do not fully trust him because he does not seem fair enough, that he is not nice enough to look at. He sighs wearily and tells them that he has had a hard life and longs for friendship, but there his looks are against him. In this little inset tale, many people have seen Tolkien warning, against his young, warning his young readers against judging friends too quickly by their appearances. It is a good warning for all of us. In the complaint in that sea of reeds, one of the young hobbits says, what do they get when they can't get hobbit? Maybe that's a thing for all of us to remember. What do the things that live in the swamp get when they can't get us? James Newson says that if we go into that swamp, it is a story of utter commitment of God to Israel and of Israel's fearful doubt. It is a story crafted in this reading. It is a story toward faith. This is, in fact, the heart of all scripture, God is presented over and over again as father, mother, lover, husband, shepherd, and friend of the people of Israel. Here God is the mighty warrior, strong in battle, truly the Lord of armies, God Almighty, who fights on the people on the side of the people of Israel. To these images, the New Testament will add one more. God as our brother Jesus. The two testaments are not two stories of two separate gods, but of one God, always united, always whole, and always so wholly committed to the people of Israel, both natural born sons and daughters and those of us adopted into the family. This is the God who stands as stern father against our failure to do justice. This is the mother who nurses us at the breast and hovers worriedly over us when we are in trouble. This is the lover who seduces us in the night and the husband who waits eagerly for his bride at the head of the procession. This is the shepherd who fires the unworthy hired hands and guides the wandering sheep back to the fold. This is the friend who whispers encouragement in the dark and who ransoms to free us from the slavers. This is the champion who stands fearless between us and all foes, willing to beat them back so that we might escape harm. And finally, this is our brother who wanders dusty roads and back alleys looking for lost brothers and sisters, who walks willingly out into danger in our place, who carries us when we are tired and weakened, who shouts encouragement when we struggle to run the marathon laid before us, and who catches us when we fail at the fall at the finish line. This extraordinary, unexpected, impossible to predict God is the center of the story of our faith. Our eyes may never have seen, but we do indeed know and love the voice of this God. It has been whispering of God's great love 
from the moment we are born. This God will pursue us to the ends of the earth and beyond, not out of a desire to control or dominate, but out of an enormous well of love. So what do we learn from the story from long ago that will strengthen our faith, our trust in God today? We learn not to let our fear stop us from stepping out in faith. As the saying goes, Gerald Jansen writes elegantly about this kind of faith, which is the willingness to pick up and carry one's fear in one's bosom like a wean child and go forward in the direction that trust calls for. If fear keeps us trapped in our suffering, then faith as trust is definitely a gift from God. The people of Israel, Jansen writes, are saved from their fear and their doubt, not just from Pharaoh's armies. When we walk into the sea of life, we follow God into the mud of life. Sometimes we find that the midges do bite and sting, and we may wonder what they eat when they can't get anything but us. Eventually, though, we come out to the, on the other side. We find that things that pursued us into the mud and the muck have been left behind. We have become stronger. We have grown, grown closer to those who have gone into the mud with us. We have learned to trust leaders who have proved themselves. We have grown weary of those who have proved themselves untrustworthy. We have found ourselves stronger for the next stage of our journey. We are one step closer to the promised land. We have new companions for the journey, and with them we sing. I will sing of the Lord who has won a glorious victory and has, shown, has thrown horses and their riders into the sea. The Lord is my strong defender, the one who has saved me. My God, and I will praise him, my parents' God, and I will sing about his greatness. The Lord who among the gods is like you, who is like you, wonderful in holiness, who can work miracles and mighty acts like yours. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed our enemies. Faithful to your promise, you led the people you had rescued. By your strength, you guided them to your sa our sacred land. We may have not walked through the waters of the Reed Sea, but the same God walks with us still. Our eyes may not have seen the waters piling up on either side of the path. We may not have walked with Jesus on a dusty road, but we walk with him still. Even when our eyes have not seen, we have seen it personally a thousand times a day. Amen. Like Paul, who was showered with an abundance of mercy from God, we too have been blessed. 
Like Paul, we are called to go forth to witness to the presence of Christ in our lives in so many diverse ways. One of the ways we tell the story is through the giving of gifts to God and through the asking of prayers of God. Come, bring your gifts and your prayers to your God. I invite you to bring your offering and any prayer requests to God at this time. I'd like you all to remember Rebecca Aiden in prayer. She's in Swedish Hospital, has attempted suicide for the fifth time, and uh, has two teenage children. So prayers for her, it's worse every time she tries. It's always with pills. So prayers for her, I think she's getting better, but she needs treatment. My niece's daughter-in-law. I'd like to ask for prayers for the two Los Angeles police that were shot earlier this morning, especially the female officer. She's got a six-year-old. Pray for him. While you're at it, please keep in prayer. Um, there was a police officer shot in Toledo two days ago. Um, his wife's mother went to school with me. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. That's okay. <laughs> so please keep them in prayer as well. Um, also, please keep in prayer the um, firefighters who were injured in fires here in Colorado in the last couple of days. There were three injured in fires in Cameroon, pa Cameroon Pass and um, not sure which other fire it was, but there were three injured in two of the fires this weekend. So you just happened to see those on West Route's um, page this morning. But at the same time, good news for the West Route Fire Department, one of their firefighters got married yesterday. So if you happen to know the um, Cornovos, the please, keep, please wish them congratulations. I just got married yesterday. <laughs> so let us pray. Dear God, we come before you in this day and in this time and ask for your prayers for those who have been injured in the line of duty. We pray especially for those who have lost their lives and for their families. Be with those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Be with young family members and with grandparents suddenly burdened with the care of children. Be with those children as they struggle to understand what has happened to their parent. Keep those who still go out to fight fires and to care for their communities as paramedics and as police officers safe. Bring them safely home to their families at the end of their shift. Oh God, we pray for Rebecca, for all of the Bundy family. We pray, O oh God, for those who are still stuck at home with illness and allergies, with fears over disease, with weakened immune systems. We pray for those who have not been able to recover. We pray, O oh God, 
that you will keep them safe. O oh God, we pray for a nation divided. Bring us peace and wisdom. Teach us to speak kindly to one another again. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray. All these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory And let us sing together now the doxology. forgive as we've been forgiven. Jesus said seven times seventy. You might make that seventy times seventy. Whatever it is, I doubt you're going to keep a record of it. Let us free ourselves from the paralyzing burden of sin. Let us go to do justice, to walk humbly with our God, and to love mercy all the days of our lives. Go in the love of God, the fellowship of the Spirit, and the peace of Christ. Alleluia and Amen. Amen.